developing the work that our board has committed to over the past year and a half. The courage that this board has taken so far to investigate the needs of our community's school facilities has been focused um, primarily with the students' best interests in mind, what a 21st century education looks like, and creating facilities that can take us into our future. So we, undergone, we underwent um, this feasibility study back in June 2021, and the major intent behind going into this feasibility study was twofold. All of us are seeing the um, new developments that are showing up within our community, and we also are aware of our aging facilities. So our maintenance and our buildings and grounds crew have done the very best that they can do with our school facilities for the amount of years um, that they have been updated. So we are now officially at the point that we need to begin taking a very serious look um, at the future of each of our facilities. So that's the purpose this evening is to engage with our community in that work. We will have a presentation um, this evening by Crabtree Rohrbaugh and PFM Financial Advisors. This community meeting this evening is intended to present the district information gathered to this point in this study and listen to the comments from our community regarding these options. This meeting is not intended to take a vote on what option to select by our board of school directors. Um, at the conclusion of tonight's presentation, we will open a period of public comment um, after, during this meeting. The public comment will follow the format of our regular board meetings. As per our practice, each speaker must be a resident or employee of the district. Each speaker will have five minutes to speak. If we run out of time for public comment, we'll record any remaining questions and place the answers on our district website. So we have multiple forms of gaining public comment during this time. The first is you being here this evening. The second, we do have many community members who are engaging with us uh, through live stream. And there is a live stream link in order for those community members to submit public comment. Those will be read publicly by Mr. Matt Muller, our Director of Safety and Communications. Um, there are also an opportunity for those who do not wish to speak publicly, but still want a question answered. So index cards were provided in writing to community members if they so chose. Um, we are compiling these questions that the community has. And what we're hoping to do is compile frequently asked questions page that will be available on our district's website under the About Us tab, Feasibility. We want this to be as transparent a process as possible. We will be meeting again March 6th, where it is my understanding that the board will begin deliberating based upon the public comment, based upon a year and a half of study of what the next steps of this process might look like. I'm grateful to have our administrative team here present with us. I'm grateful to have each and every one of you here in person and online present with us. And I also would like to acknowledge the board for their commitment over the past year and a half. Thank you. So at this time, I would like to introduce Mr. Anthony Colstock from Crabtree Rorba um, to set off our presentation for this evening. Thank you. So my name is Anthony Colstock. I'm an architect uh, and a principal of Crabtree Robone Associates. Just to give you a, a little bit of background with our firm, we are located in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. We're just right up the road on Route 15. Uh, we have worked with a lot of districts throughout the state and in particular in central Pennsylvania. Uh, I particularly have worked with a lot of neighboring districts such as Bermudian Springs, Littlestown, Gettysburg, Hanover. I've done multiple projects uh, with those districts. Uh, so our firm has specialized in K-12 uh, education, 
for over uh, 30 years. Uh, I have over two decades of experience myself. Uh, we also have offices in Virginia and Maryland as well. So just to go over the study, I, there's a lot of slides, but this is just to not give you all of the information, but a quick overview. Everything that I'm gonna present with just a, just a little bit of information um, on your projected enrollment, but everything in this presentation has already uh, been reviewed with the school board. There is nothing new. As Dr. Perry mentioned, uh, this information was started to, um, started to happen in 2021. Um, so this is just the agenda that we're gonna go over for, uh, for this evening. So the first thing that we're gonna look at is well, what was the purpose of the study? The purpose of the study is to help the district with shorten long-term planning, that they can develop a master plan on how are they going to um, take care of their facilities? How are they going to, um, oops, excuse me. How are they going to plan for future enrollment, whether your enrollment growth is increasing or it's decreasing? Um, it's used to help set uh, priorities with capital improvement projects. Um, it's also used for uh, if you're looking for educational improvements as far as your vision and maybe there's a certain curriculum that you the district wants to add, but there is an adequate space in the facility. So how do you plan for that future educational program? Uh, one other thing is that the, part, the Department of Education, they used to provide uh, subsidies and reimbursement to districts. That hasn't happened in about 10 years, but when they did provide these subsidies, part of the requirement was to have a study done before a project began. So the Department of Education has a checklist as to what's to be included in the study for a project to be eligible. And while that moratorium still hasn't been lifted, every time that we do a study, we are hoping that that fund, funding from the state will become available. So we wanna make sure that the study meets all the Department of Education's checklist. And then this will just help the district with uh, a decision-making guide with that study on how are they gonna move forward with any potential renovations or facility improvements. So the Department of Education, um, there's a couple of things that they require to make, to make this study complete. Um, it's first an educational program overview uh, to understand where you're at with how many spaces that you have, the capacity of those spaces, whether those sp spaces meet some of the guidelines of the Department of Education. They also want a, an, uh, an enrollment projection. Uh, the district hired a third party consultant to do the enrollment projections called Decision Insight. Our firm also can provide those uh, uh, en uh, enrollment uh, projections. But in this case, there was a third party that came in with the district then we're also required to do an analysis of the existing conditions of your facilities, give our professional opinion on the age of the facilities, uh, life cycle of the facilities as to when things need to start um, to be renovated, where the deficiencies in the building systems and in the interior finishes. And then what we do is we'll develop some options. Uh, sometimes they're just status quo options that just bring the buildings up to current construction standards. And it's not looking at the educational program. It's not looking at future enrollment, but we also put together options that will address your future enrollment, will help you build a vision with your educational program. So as Dr. Perry mentioned, our firm was hired in spring of 2021. These dates on here are all of the updates that I have given to the board since 2021. And you can see all those things that we talked about with the enrollment, the existing facility conditions, um, the options, 
cost estimates for the options. They were given in 2021. Um, the, the districts contemplated some of these options. They got back in touch with us August of last year. We looked at developing some more options. Um, and then we presented, we presented a few rounds of those to the board and then provided cost estimates in January of, of this year, just last, last month. So I mentioned before, this study can also be used as a decision-making guide. Uh, one thing that the, the board and the administration also discussed is, well, what are our core, what are the district's core values that when it comes time to establish a criteria um, or magnitude of priorities, where do we stand as a district on how we want our facilities to serve our community? So they came up with these core, core values on how the building should operate, how it should help the students, and what the facilities mean to the community. And then from there, they developed these guiding principles that will help with the decision-making process that you can set up a sort of a, um, a priority matrix. So a couple of things are very important, important is ad addressing uh, future enrollment growth, um, addressing any deficiencies in the building codes with your current facilities, and also making the spaces equitable for the students. So in the elementary level, in the K to three, making sure that kids that go to one elementary school have the same opportunities and experiences that students in the other elementary school have. So as I mentioned, we do this projected enrollment analysis. Uh, we look at the Department of Education. They provide, um, they provide enrollment projections for 10 years. These are just based on live births within your district. Our firm, we will also do a, an enrollment analysis. And this is based on uh, five, historical data of five-year trends. In this case, we're looking at your historical growth before COVID, uh, understanding that during the pandemic, some students may have left and they're slowly starting to come back. So what we do is we, we go back between 2014 to 2019 to, to see where that enrollment was going, where it was trending to build that enrollment projection. Uh, then as I mentioned, there was the third party consultant that the district hired, Decision Insight, they provide us with their information and they will provide a conservative and moderate enrollment projection. And then what we do is we'll look at what is the average of the two? What is the line of best fit? And in the case of this study, the district was using that line of best fit from the information from Decision Insight as how they were going to plan for future enrollment for the next five years. So the information that Decision Insight originally gave was in 2021. Uh, at that time, there was a slight decline in enrollment. Recently, like very recently, they have updated their enrollment projections, and we're really starting to see a lot more growth within the district. So the next few slides are just going to um, – be enrollment projections based upon the grade level groupings that you have within the district. So the first one is across the board K-12. And there is a projection of 260 more students from your current enrollment until the 26-27 school year. So you can see that overall within the district, um, that's trending up. That's going to average uh, maybe like around 30 students a grade. However, most of the students that are going to be coming into the district, they're coming in at the elementary school level. And you can see this was the graph for, and just to kind of orient, the, uh, the blue line was the projection from Decision Insight in 2021. The green one is the current one. You'll see at the K-3 grade level, there's going to be uh, 
in the next three to four years, an increase of over 150 students. And then in the four, six grade level, 98 students. And at the middle school, 13 students. And as I mentioned, most of the students are coming in um, at the elementary level. But once you get past that academic year of 26, 27, you'll start to see a little bit more growth within the middle school and the high school. And so the high school was only about 36 students from your current enrollment. So that current enrollment is uh, based on numbers that the district reports to the Department of Education in October of 2022. So the next part of the study is to, now that we have the enrollment projections, we know what the current enrollment is, is we do a capacity analysis of the existing facilities. Um, and that capacity is, well, how many, how many students can, can a building hold? Uh, that analysis is a little different for elementary schools as it is for middle schools and high schools. And we use this as a way to determine if your buildings are overcrowded or if they're underutilized. So you're looking just for that, that right fit. Um, and also you have to understand that you don't want a school at 100% capacity, that every desk, every seat in the building is being occupied, that there has to have some flexibility, there has to be some uh, a, a buffer of space uh, to help with scheduling um, and having kids move around the building. And sometimes, you know, your average class sizes for, for one program might be a little bit more than the other. So we look at the capacity just to make sure that everybody isn't confused. It's not what the code allows. If we look at strictly what the building code allows, the capacity would be much higher. So this is a this is a, a number set forth by the Department of Education, where typically it's 25 students on average per classroom. Some districts, and in the case of yours, um, districts have their own thresholds. And so that is so that the districts can keep classes at a student capacity that they feel comfortable with. So in the case of your district, your kindergarten through fifth grade, they operate anywhere from like 20 to 24 students. And then once you get into fifth on up, typically it's 25 uh, students per classroom. Some labs and specials uh, the Department of Education only calculates 20 students uh, per class. So then from there, I, I mentioned before that you, you want to have that flexibility and that buffer within the school that not every seat is being occupied. So what we do is we apply a utilization rate to the school. So in the case of an elementary school, you want to operate at about a 90% utilization rate. And that's with the understanding that um, when you have students that will leave a general classroom to go to one of their specials, whether they're going to music or art, then that class that they left then sits empty. Uh, but in the case of a middle school or a high school, when they leave that class, more students are coming in. So you can calculate more capacity at the high school and middle school level for class for, for the specials such as tech ed, art, music, your library, uh, your gymnasium. So the way that we do this exercise is we meet with the building principals. We want to understand how you utilize the space. Um, in the as I mentioned with. Uh, elementary schools, you're just looking at the general classrooms. You're not looking at special education or the specials. We also meet with um, the intermediate uh, principal. We take these plans, we color code them according to the program and the department. 
There's the middle school, high school. And then what we'll do is with that capacity, we'll compare it to your current enrollment, and then we compare it to the projected enrollment. So if you see in, you'll see that in these rows, we have uh, the elementary level with CTE and NOE combined uh, enrollment, and then a separate line item for CVIS. So here's the, here's the capacity of these two schools uh, between CTE and NOE, it's roughly 1200 students. For Kanawago, it's uh, CVIS, it's, it's roughly a thousand. And then you'll see down below, this is the 712 grade grouping, about 900 for the middle school, 1800 for the high school. And then we compare it to the current enrollment. Now this was done with 2019 enrollment data because of the pandemic, because knowing that students had left, we wanted to use a higher number. And you'll see most of these, the capacity of, of these buildings, elementary school is just right. Um, CBIS is a good spot. Middle school and high school, a little bit under the utilization. Usually uh, we're looking at um, 80, 85% utilization at a middle school and high school. But then when you factor in the enrollment projections that I shared with you, which is this column right here, you now start to see that CTE and NOE within those next four years is gonna be at 100% capacity. So there isn't that flexibility within the school for that, um, that incoming enrollment. CVIS, it's not terrible, it's 90%. There's a lot of flex spaces in that building. Um, a lot of special classrooms in that building that they have some of that room to breathe. And then you look at the middle school and the high school. Well, yes, I did mention that eventually there will be that enrollment that's coming in at the elementary level. We'll get to the middle school and high school. It's still operating about 10% lower utilization. Um, so that has room to grow. So we're only looking at additional space required at uh, Conewago Township and New Oxford Elementary. So the next analysis that we'll do is we have engineering consultants uh, that we bring on board, mechanical, electrical, plumbing engineers, uh, civil engineer. We also do a lot of discussions with the facilities department of the district to do an analysis and recommendations for your existing, uh, your existing facilities. So we will tour the buildings, we'll talk to the principals, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll talk to the director of facilities, then we'll provide recommendations on how to bring the buildings up to current construction standards. Then we put costs together on how to upgrade um, how much it is to just bring it to the current standard. The district can use this for future capital improvement projects. One of the things that's very important to note in, in uh, this analysis is, are there any building systems that could potentially um, interrupt the disruption of the instructional education? And in this case, we didn't find any. However, there are a lot of aging systems. So when I show these pictures, uh, I just want to start off with saying that the average school um, age in the United States is 40 years. Uh, typically, just like you would with your own residence, you're going to need improvements and renovations every 20 years. Typically, building materials, building systems, that's about the life cycle that they have. So the photos that we show and these deficiencies that we're going to point out, it's not meant to be an insult. It's not meant to say that your school is any lesser than another school or that your children aren't getting a quality education. It's just to note what the age of the building and certain things that are past 
their life expectancy. There's a, a lot of photos to go through here. I'm just going to kind of try to go through some of these very quickly. Uh, so we put a little these little bullet points and narratives together for the board to review this. So the first one we're going to look at is CTE. And we... We did notice on the new edition um, some efflorescence and, and salt getting into the brick veneer, uh, some water coming into the vestibule. So there's some moisture penetration. Uh, some of the windows, the double pane windows also had condensation. So these windows would potentially need replaced. We saw uh, carpet and some floor tile that were past its past its age. Uh, also the plumbing systems in, in CTE and in NOE, uh, they are in a they're in a trench that runs underneath of the corridors in the original buildings. And these spaces, while the scale of the photos may look a little deceiving, um, this is very narrow and it is very, you practically can't get into this space to access it. These pipes would then put, would need to be replaced. Uh, once these pipes leave the building, the material is terracotta. There's the potential for cracks um, in those pipes and whether it's stormwater or whether it's sewage, that that would then dissipate into uh, your school grounds. Uh, you can see the orange carpet. That is definitely a 1970s carpet. There was a couple of classrooms that had to be relocated into a storage room, like small group instruction classrooms. So th those rooms don't even have a floor finish. It's just bare concrete. Uh, outdated casework was past its life cycle. So this is the casework in the classrooms for the sinks and some of the uh, the storage or the student cubbies. Um, even outdated instructional walls. Uh, typically in renovated projects, districts move away from chalkboards just because of their quality issues and they go to whiteboards. Noticed a lot of ADA deficiencies, things like uh, latch side clearances to doors or um, plumbing fixtures, sinks or toilets that aren't ADA accessible. Uh, some of the plumbing systems, extremely outdated. Uh, the sink on this right-hand side is, is not ADA accessible. And so we'll move on to New Oxford. Um, overall, the, the building envelope at, at NOE was in pretty good shape. Uh, the drive it or EFA system around some of the, uh, the entryways or some of the pre precast concrete sills, we did, they could be cleaned or repaired. So a lot of cracks in the terrazzo and the original um, in the original uh, uh, portion of NOE. And it's a little tough to see in this photo, but um, if you notice this terrazzo, the discoloration is because those plumbing trenches underneath needed some repair. And all this terrazzo, and this is, this terrazzo is cementitious three inches thick that needed to be pulled up so that that those plumbing, that piping system could be accessed. And then the patchwork had to be done. Unfortunately, the patchwork could not match the existing. And then you can see in this photo, this is even, these trenches are even tighter to get into than the ones at CTE. So the, it, the interior finishes, outdated tile or uh, patchwork 
or replacement tile pieces that had to be installed that the district could not find a match. So you see that these darker blue uh, tile pieces, these were ones that were added because this original tile is so old that you can't find, you can't find it anymore. Same way with the carpet. Uh, a, a VCT in the gymnasium, not an athletic floor, not a whether it's a, a rubber, a synthetic rubber athletic floor, or even a, a, a wood floor. Um, see the stage in the in the cafeteria. Uh, the curtain um, is past its 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 age. Uh, the stage floor, wood floor, needs refinished. And again, some more. ADA compliance issues, instructional walls, you know, old chalkboards. There's a couple code compliance um, issues that we saw with egress out of the buildings. So th uh, these exits out of the building are not ADA accessible. Some more ADA issues in the public restrooms. You can see original um, toilets. They're probably 30, 40 years old. CVIS was in very good condition. Just call, saw a couple of things with the building envelope, whether it was the brick, the windows. Some of this could just be cleaned. Not all the needs replaced. There were some flooring issues at CVIS and some cracking due to settlement of the, um, the concrete slab. CVIS is approaching 20 years old. So that would be one project that we would recommend some of these capital improvement uh, improvements to. Summer work, do it over the course of a few years. And then the middle school, most of the middle school, there was some HVAC improvements that were done to the middle school. There's some other MEP systems that uh, could be expanded on to improve that. But overall, the middle school and the high school, most of the issues that we picked up on were more of the finishes, carpet, ceiling tile, paint, casework. I mean, you can, you can just tell by some of the colors of the casework, it dates it. Um, just some, these are some code compliance issues where anytime you have doors that swing out in the hallways, just have to be careful that uh, there is a, there is a, uh, the door can only take up so much um, space in the hallway because in the event that someone opens up a door in the event of emergency, you don't want to hit somebody that's running down the hallway to try to get out of the building. That's why you see doors that are pocketed in, in, in new school construction. And then the high school, very similar to the, to the middle school. Bleachers, uh, weight room, aging systems, past their life, casework, science labs, carpet and tile, instructional walls, outdated locker rooms. And then one other recommendation that we made to the district is potentially moving the, administra the administrative uh, waiting area more to the exterior so that anytime you have visitors coming in, they have to go through that checkpoint rather than giving them access to the school before they go through that checkpoint. It's just a safety protocol. So when we developed the options in 2021, I must say we probably had about nine options or so. Um, 
after we revisit the options last year, we brought them down to three. And we had some refinement of those options. And again, we really want to make sure that these options align with the district's vision, that they're uh, it's meeting their guiding principles. So these three, the, the big move in all three of them is what to do with the inequities between NOE and CTE and potentially have a one campus model so that all the students are on this campus to help improve the operations and help share resources for the students. But the first option is just to do additions and renovations at CTE and NOE. And then in all of the options, CVIS would have those limited renovations. And then uh, the middle school and high school at some point would have some of those additional renovations to, to meet some of those deficiencies and, and um, address those uh, aging uh, finishes. Option two is new construction of a, uh, a new K-3 building on the main campus. And CTE would be vacated. Um, NOE would then be demolished. Um, any athletic fields or multi-purpose fields that would be built on uh, with the construction of this new school would then be relocated over to the NOE site. And then the third option, again, is going back to a one campus model where CTE would be vacated and a new K-1 building would be constructed on the campus. And then NOE would strictly be a second and third grade building. So we, we, we put these conceptual plans together for some of them. You can see in orange, that's where the additions would be um, added on to the building to address the future enrollment. We also want to address, as I mentioned before, CTE is another one of those schools that you walk into the lobby before you walk through the administration area. So uh, we would want to make sure that we strategically place a main entrance for that when visitors are coming to the school, they're going through that space. We also want to have a clear separation of parents and bus drop off. We create two new main entrances for students to come in, but they're essentially coming into the same space. Then what we would do is we would set up these academic wings that this wing is a grade grouping, this wing is a grade grouping, that one and that one, so on and so forth. There are also some classrooms at CTE that do not have natural daylight, and we would relocate those to another uh, part of the building. So this is the site plan. As we mentioned, we would uh, separate the, the parent and the bus drop-off. This could be the bus drop-off with the student centering at this location. Parents and visitors and the parking for faculty would be located here. And you'll see in orange the additions that we proposed. This would add about 40 new uh, parking spaces. We could get. We understand you have a lot of parent queuing issues at pickup. Uh, it can get approximately 25 cars in, in this option that could stack. And then at NOE, again, we're addressing equity. So um, there is only a, uh, there is a, a smaller multi-purpose room at NOE. We proposed to convert that to a library and then the construction of a new gymnasium that would be equivalent uh, to, to CTE, and then the additions for the future enrollment. And then also look at the traffic patterns and separating parents from the buses and also making sure that there's enough queuing spaces uh, for the parent drivers picking up students. So you'll see that there's a, here's a loop for the parents and there's, Approximately 30 cars that could stack here. It's located 
adjacent to the main entrance and then a separate bus drop off at, at this location where the uh, the bus riders would enter in at that entrance into the school. And then option two, this is the new K-3 option. What we did with the administration was we built an educational program. We want it to be exactly the same in the renovations that we were proposing to CTE and NOE. So it's an apples to apples comparison. And with that educational program, we can then establish a anticipated size of the building. How many square feet is it going to be? Then with that square footage, we can then build a construction cost estimate and a project estimate. So this building would uh, approximately be about 212,000 square feet. We looked at we looked at a couple of different concepts, but these this one seemed to be the one that we kind of favored. Again, this is very conceptual in nature. So we would have uh, two grade groupings, kindergarten and first grade over here, second and third, and these two academic wings over here, and then shared spaces in between, gymnasium, auxiliary gym, cafeteria, with a library on the second floor. And then each, so it would operate as two schools within one school. Each would have its own administrative area. And again, we would want to make sure that uh, any visitors, they understand what school that they're going through. They're going through that checkpoint to get into the school through that administrative uh, waiting and reception area. We looked at putting it on the uh, athletic fields behind the middle school. Again, this is just conceptual in, in nature. Just wanted to see how many buses that we could stack with the driveways, where the driveways would be located how the parking and the parent uh, the parent loop could tie into the existing parking for the middle school. We also looked at there's a property that the district owns that's adjacent to the middle school. Could it potentially fit on that site? Our analysis of the exercise that we went through said, no, this is very hard to develop on because of some of the existing conditions and the wetlands. And then option three, this was the K-1 um, that would be most likely could be located in that same uh, location of the K-3 building. We didn't build a concept, a concept for this, but we were able to come up with the square footage so we could help us build um, a cost estimate that was about 115,000 square feet. And then from there, we can put a cost estimate together for this. So we'll, we'll build the cost estimate. So we're looking at construction costs. What's the cost for the bricks and mortar? But then we wanna anticipate all the additional soft costs that would need to be included. So things like financing for a bond, um, all the design professional fees, some of the due diligence that's gonna be required, permitting fees that um, you'll potentially have with any new construction from the county and the municipality and acquiring a building permit, permit, setting aside a contingency for unforeseen conditions during construction, that the district has budgeted some money that in the event that something happens with the site, um, or there's maybe some omissions from the construction drawings that there is money to capture for those additional costs. So just here's a summary of all the options. So here's option one. This is just the ad reno to CTE and NOE. Uh, we put these in a range because right now this is still conceptual in nature. As we, if a project was then selected, a comprehensive project was selected, once we move into design, we start to know more about the scope of work. We start to um, develop these a little bit, more, fine tune them and do a little bit more detail. So this option one, just for the uh, K3 was between 48 to $54 million. Then when you factor in those renovations to CVIS and the high school, you're looking at 74 to $84 million. For option two, for the new ele elementary school, 
that was between 78 to 81 million dollars factor in the same cost for CVIS and the middle school that's estimated between 1.4 to 1.12 and then the K1 option of renovations to NOE between 22 to 24 million the new K1 between 40 41 to 43 and then again, the um, seven through 12 renovations, 90 million to 98 million. There are some costs that have uh, been very upfront with the board, some costs that haven't been accounted for in all these options. Uh, site development costs were not included for the new construction. Um, we did have a very rough estimate, but it was still very early on to understand, uh, to get a, a good range on that. And then while it's not required, CTE and NOE do not have sprinkler systems. Um, that could be something that if that option was selected for the renovation, uh, it could be something that we could look at to see what is more cost effective. Do we, uh, do we not put it in or uh, do, we, uh, do we put a fire protection system in? Uh, there's this... The, at that point, the code requires we have to break the building down into more um, separate buildings uh, to prevent the spread of fire. Thank, thank you, Anthony. Um, I think there's a slide that's going to go up here to talk a little bit about the financing of this. Um, again, my name is uh, Brad Remig. I'm with PFM Financial Advisors. Uh, Garrett Moore is with me here tonight as well. Um, to give you a little of idea of who we are, um, PFM Financial Advisors, although you probably don't see a lot of advertisements, we're the largest at what we do in the Commonwealth and in the country. Uh, we are independent advisors that work with school districts to um, secure financing for capital projects. We're not a bank. We're not investment bankers. We don't have our own funds to lend. It's our job to represent the district and secure the funds in the most cost-effective manner so they can undertake whatever projects they would like to do. I think I've been coming to Conewago Valley since the late 90s. I started working for PFM in 1990. I really focused on school district finance in the late 90s as well. So this is kind of what we do um, in the Commonwealth itself. I think we represent over 200 school districts locally and across the state. So this is kind of a, my bread and butter and our bread and butter as well. So there's a lot of numbers on this page. You'll notice with financial advisors, we don't have as many colors, okay? <laughs> and as many uh, details, we really focus on the numbers and things of that nature. What we worked with the district on doing is based on the different projects that have been discussed or exploring or being explored, um, based on the timing, um, figure out how much money it is that we may need to borrow or finance over a period of time and figure out how we can carefully plan out a plan to not all borrow the money at once, but over time. Because one thing that is, if you borrow all the money at once, you can imagine your payment gets quite high rather quickly. And really to plan appropriately financially for a project of this magnitude, you want to do different financings over a period of time. So we get take the money down when we need it, we don't over borrow and we figure out, you know, as the project unfolds, how much money we really do need uh, to pay for all this. What on this sheet, it might be difficult to see, or it's very difficult to see, is we, we did um, two of the scenarios. The top chart, the top half, a suit puts together a, a one page plan if you were to do option two that Anthony described. That's the new K through three building. Um, do some work uh, to the high school and middle school, as well as the intermediate school. We have uh, on the left, the new building, some of the different stages, estimated costs from the different stages. Um, as was mentioned before, for that new K-3 building, it's about 85 million or so. We just kind of took a number in the middle. Uh, we kind of estimated based on the timing and the needs that this project would likely occur over the next, I'm going to guess, uh, planning has started, but hopefully the building would be open in the August of 2027. So that's four and a half years or so from now. And we listed here 
uh, when we would draw the money down, okay? Some early dollars, not as much as needed just for the planning and some of those natures of those things, but some of the larger draws would, would happen later as that unfolded. We then wanted to make sure we gave an idea because people think of this in terms of mills or millage equivalents. Okay, what does this mean in terms of a mill? Because a lot of folks um, understand mills. And based on these draws, you'll notice for the new K through three building, this would be the millage equivalent necessary um, for the new building. Uh, and it's about a, uh, about a one, one and a half mills, maybe a little bit more when you add those all those up. Then we wanted to put in here, we worked with the district to say, okay, what does that mean to a taxpayer that has a home assessed at, in this case, $100,000? The way that mills work is basically what you do is for one mill, you take the last di three digits, I'll call it off, or move the decimal point over three places. So one mill on a $100,000 home means $100. That's what that means. And for those of you that have you know the assessed value of your home, you can do this calculation uh, on your assessed value. So when you look at this complete option two, which included not only the new building, but also some work to the high school, middle school, and the intermediate school, okay, if that was the option two selected, that would be total draws. We're guessing at this point, and a lot of these things obviously are going to change, okay, but we wanted to give an idea of a snapshot in time of a plan. Um, you can see there would be additional draws that would continue through 2029. So here we are, you know, almost six or seven years from now. And the total millage equivalent for that package or option number two, as estimated today, again, we're trying to just put something out there to get this started. It's about 2.3 mills millage equivalent for the, for, for the financing to do the bonds and to borrow the money to do that. Uh, much like when you borrow your money to do projects, you know, you 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 amortize or pay it off over a certain period of time. Uh, we're still running different numbers to look at these scenarios, but this would be a long-term financing. It's not a five-year loan. It's probably something in the 20 to 30-year range. Okay, we still have to go through all those discussions, but that's going to be a long-term financing uh, that would likely take place for that option number two. And we also broke it down with the help of the district to take not only the annual effect of the bond debt, but just up, but on a monthly basis, what that might look like. It's basically the yearly number divided by 12 because there's 12 months in the year. So that's what we did that. Um, for the top option, you'll notice that this, uh, this plan would really kind of go over seven or eight years. It's not going to all be at once. As I mentioned before, we want to make sure that it's phased in and stepped in over time. So it becomes more absorbable within the budget and more uh, you know, of a phase into the, to the taxpayer. The bottom half shows the scenario or option number one scenario. And that was the renovation work that was described by Anthony at the, the two existing elementaries, some work at the high school, middle school, and a little bit more work at the intermediate school. Um, these were the estimated costs. Kind of, we took something, kind of what Anthony gave and put it in the middle, something like that. Uh, maybe a little bit more for some, any other remaining improvements, but a total uh, project of about $85 million uh, to do that uh, is about where we're looking at now. Now, what that would allow us to do is to, if that was the, op the option selected, it would probably be need to take, instead of uh, seven draws, maybe we could do it in four, but you can see some of those draws would be heavier in the beginning. Um, and therefore we'd have to borrow more money more quickly. Um, and it would probably continue over a uh, nine or 10 year uh, period to phase in the debt payments. You can see here, this is, would be the estimated for the millage um, equivalent for any new debt. And we're just talking about new debt again here. Um, and that is just shy of one and a half mills, 1.46. And again, to equate it to $100,000 assessed value, about $146 is what's estimated at this point in time uh, for this. So we again, we wanted to give kind of a, put a you know a, a number or something out there so people could see what this might look like if we financed it over these periods of time. There's a long way to go. We don't we, we're still working on projects drawing. Anthony did a really nice job of describing that. We're talking through timing, things of that nature, but we wanted to try and put it out, give you some type of idea of what a, a, a this might look like in terms of millage equivalent.
Okay, thank you so much. Um, so the next steps of the process then, um, community outreach and the involvement in reviewing these options, the board deliberates these options beginning at our March 6th meeting, which is our study session. And at that point, no decision will be made. Um, so I can't overemphasize this, that there is no decision, there is no administrative recommendation to the board as of yet, as we're still collecting the data. Um, the board then will select the option that aligns with our vision and our budget at a future board meeting. So once they've had the opportunity to engage the community, continue to receive public comment and questions where we feel we've been able to answer the questions that are brought forth by our community at that point at the board's comfort, um, they'll continue to engage in that discussion um, and make a decision you know, for our school district moving forward. So this is really exciting times for us in Conewago Valley School District. We know that the money signs are large and uh, we are truly at a pinnacle point here where our aging facilities are gonna require us to do something. So we're all keenly aware of that. It's just what direction do we believe is gonna be the best 20 year decision for our future colonials. So um, at this time, we would like to hear from you. We're going to engage in some public comment. Um, so I'm going to ask Mr. Muller, our Director of Safety and Communications. He already has access to some of the questions that have been coming through online or were shared with us in advance. So at this time, Mr. Muller. Thank you, Dr. Perry. I'll use, I can use this one for now. Questions submitted online, I'll begin. We, we had a few, all district residents, obviously we can uh, ask of right now. Luke Crabo had the first question. What exactly, or what is exactly included in the soft cost estimate amount? And number two, what is the projected cost of relocating the baseball fields if they need to be moved? And number three, whether renovating or new construction, how can local companies be used or involved in this process? Third one. Whether renovating or new construction, how can local companies be used or involved if preferred? Was that a question before the presentation or just recently? That was submitted today, I believe. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so the the first question, as far as the soft cost, I did quickly review that during the during the presentation. Uh, the soft cost would include the permitting fees. Uh, this would be permitting fees for the building permit, the local municipality the county, uh, testing and inspection fees uh, for concrete testing, soil testing, structural testing that's required during construction, a construction contingency, as I noted, so that the district sets aside some money in their, in their budget for some unforeseen conditions, design professional fees, so whether it's the architect, food service consultants, all the different engineers, structural, MEP engineers, civil engineers, uh, some due diligence on understanding uh, the site potentially, uh, whether it's a survey or geotechnical reports, uh, would also include if it's new spaces or if it's new construction, uh, loose uh, furniture, equipment, uh, new desks, chairs, um, some new data equipment, and also financing fees for um, acquiring the bond. So that was the first question. Second part of that was, what is the projected cost of relocating baseball fields? Yeah, so that, to be moved? Yeah, that cost was not included because at that time, uh, we really didn't have a discussion with the board as to what those fields would look like. But it has been discussed that 
if you select that option and those fields need to be relocated, the additional cost uh, that would be required is for the demolition of NOE, because there's going to be a cost to that, and then the site work associated with it. And there's been some discussions as to whether it's going to, you know, uh, how many baseball or softball fields or uh, multi-purpose fields, whether it's uh, soccer. We've we've discussed it, but that scope of work has not been defined to a point where we can put a cost estimate together. And then the last one was that was the involvement of yeah. local companies if we sure. choose to renovate yeah. our building. So th these projects would be publicly bid. Uh, public bidding requires us to bid a multi-prime contract with a minimum of four contractors. Typically, we would we would bid for um, we would put a, a a packet a package together for general construction, HVAC construction, uh, plumbing construction, and electrical construction. Sometimes, depending on the, the scope of work, if it's large enough, we may have a separate site construction package. Um, so it would be competitively bid. And if there are any local companies that would want to bid as a prime contractor, they just have to meet the specifications and the qualifications that are required. Um, but also, you can submit a bid during the uh, the bid period as a subcontractor to the prime bidders that are going to bid on the on the project. Um, our office it's not it's not uncommon that we would have subcontractors that may contact us to say, "Hey, could you send me a list of the bidders that you have for the the project?" We keep track of all of that, and then we could send that information to those local companies that could then contact them and say. You know, we're interested in bidding maybe something with concrete on this project. Uh, all of our projects, we also list on multiple builders exchange throughout uh, throughout the country that they could potentially uh, look at the the drawings and the, and the scope of work uh, to see if they feel that they could put a, a bid together as a sub. <clears throat> Thank you. Next question here online is from Eric Bowden here in New Oxford, district resident. If we are renovating elementary schools, how much improvement would actually be done? We need to ask ourselves, is it worth displacing the students and staff to renovate the existing elementary schools, one of which was built in 1953? Uh, we, would, we would propose a full comprehensive renovation. Now we have talked with the district, if they had a budget of X amount of dollars, um, you can only do so much with that with that amount of money. So the finished product would look like it was a renovated uh, renovated building. Uh, we'd have to prioritize some of the systems that would remain, which could potentially need upgrades or replacement down the road. And we did look at that option early on. We then also, and this is reflected in this presentation, is if we could do a comprehensive renovation to the building that we're replacing as much of the systems as we can. Um, one of the things that our engineers would do is they would look into uh, the expected life of some of these existing systems. Can we reuse them? Or are these systems that are close to, um, to their life expect expectancy that they would need to be replaced. Um, and you know, we, we do a lot of projects. And as I mentioned, we work with a lot of district neighboring districts where we have done additions and renovations. And you can go into some of these facilities. And if you see photos of the before and after, they look like, they look like new buildings. Um, anytime you do an additions and renovations project, contractors do understand that What's important is the operation of, of the school, that they're going to have to work around the students. Uh, they understand that student safety is of the utmost importance. Uh, there are certain school code laws that prohibits 
firearms, tobacco use, things like that on, on the premise. Um, there, we would have to look into the phasing of construction as well. How much summer work can they get done? So we're not displacing students, does get noisy. Um, we've talked to the district about potentially if they were to move forward with those additions, renovations, maybe uh, acquiring modulars uh, to have the students um, occupy those. We'd look at probably about a two-year construction period for an additions and renovations. So there, you know, there, there will be some disruption, but you know, we really want to emphasize the uh, safety of, of the students. Thank you. Next question is from resident Lisa Miller from Hamilton Township. In the published proposals, there's no mention of using the property located on the 500 block of Berlin Road. Has this been considered? If so, what is the reason for not utilizing this property? Is that the farm? I believe so. Yeah. I believe that is. We we didn't develop any concepts on that property, uh, but one of the things that we looked at is the public utilities and additional cost to run public utilities to that site. And at one point, we did have some cost estimates um, for that site, and we were looking anywhere from like a 1.5 to a 2 million additional cost from uh, some of those numbers that we just looked at to put the new construction um, on that property. Okay, hey, thank you. And our final question submitted in advance uh, has a question woven into it, but it's more of a statement. Um, why is this project being proposed using tax dollars rather than raising funds through a capital campaign that can be broken out into stages? Taxpayers are struggling under the strain of rising costs due to inflation, and the school district proposing extraneous spending at this time is both tone deaf and fiscally irresponsible. Now is not the time to spend tax dollars on a $100 million plus building project paid for by taxpayers. Now is the time for the school district to tighten their belts, work within the budget, and make the most out of the resources they have. We, as taxpayers, have been warned by the district of expansion needs coming down the pipeline, and now the new buildings, staff, buses, desks, equipment, and supplies will be necessary and costly once the proposed developments within the Conemaugh Valley School District are built. So now, as ground has been broken on several of these developments, you want to propose a building project that will cost over $100 million to house the students that we already have when your district officials have already warned us of expansion yet again. As a taxpayer, I say no. We are not your blank checkbook or endless funds. If you want to spend more time or more than you have available in, in existing tax revenue you already collect, the answer is not turning to the taxpayers to fund what you have, what you don't have, or pretending to seek their permission or input. The answer is to raise a question. Sorry about that. And that part cut off, but that was that was the end of the end of the statement. And that was from Danielle Smith, Main Street. I'm not sure if that's in town or not. The make sure it's town? Okay. And that is the last question slash statement online. The one thing I can add to that, mm -hmm. um, a little bit more of a statement than a question. Uh, one thing we also include in our cost estimate is um, escalation factor, knowing that any one of these projects could potentially take a year to get through the municipal uh, approvals and design. And then also knowing that the construction could also take two years as well. So we factor in some escalation costs to account um, for any rising labor or construction costs between the time of the estimate and the time of construction. Um, and in my experience, with all the districts I have worked through, uh, worked with over the state of Pennsylvania, um, capital campaigning is extremely difficult. Uh, I think I've probably only seen about a million and a half dollars raised by a school district to be able, and that's a lot, um, to help support um, a district project. Okay, thank you. That concluded all of our pre-online submitted questions.
Uh, we also offered a format when you registered, if you didn't feel comfortable uh, asking your question right now to write them down, we didn't get any of those. So I will open up to a third method of questioning uh, and I'll walk around. We have a question in the back. Uh, we would just ask if you're district residents, just state your first name and maybe the township or borough that you're representing. Did your surveys of our existing school pay any attention to the strength of the exterior doors and their locks and to the strength and locking systems of the interior, interior classroom doors and to the condition, strength and height of the ground floor windows? And if so, what did you learn? Well, one, of the, um, one of the practices that our firm uses and actually a, a lot of the school architects throughout the state is um, it's an organization that is called SEPTED. It's crime prevention through environmental design. Um, this is an organization, is a national organization that has been developed by law enforcement and architects um, with uh, the sole focus on student safety and security. And we practice uh, and we've been doing this for over two decades. Um, a lot of their best practices and recommendations, uh, we implement those into our design. Um, it is not uncommon that we will consult with local law enforcement to get their recommendations. And you would be surprised that with all the projects, again, that we have done over the state, local law enforcement a lot of times have different opinions on how they will, um, uh, some of the recommendations that they would give or concerns from their first responders. Um, we also will have uh, electrical engineers involved in the project that, um, that we'll, we'll focus a little bit more on passive security, uh, but we'll also bring in consultants like an electrical engineer, door and hardware consultants uh, to discuss card access, security cameras, intrusion detection, fire alarm. Um, did I mention security cameras? Uh, so they're an integral part of the team. And then anytime a district has school resource officers or a security director, we also want to bring them onto the team and discuss you know, what, what do you feel is is the best design for the operation of your school um, and then making sure that that information on that design is then being relayed to the administrators and the faculty that they understand this is how the building is going to be designed and that you can put an emergency plan in place so some of those questions it's a little too early um, but you know a lot of, a lot of districts are a lot of districts are different uh, we've had some law enforcement um, in some districts where they've been advocates for bulletproof glass at the front of the school and other local law enforcement that have recommend. No, I, we think the bulletproof glass is maybe a little bit of overkill or um, in the event of a hostage situation and that bulletproof that bulletproof glass is actually preventing us from getting into the building. So um, still a little too early with some of those questions, but. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, well, I had noted um, at the high school and at the um at cte the lack of the secure vestibule that those were potential um supervision deficiencies that that the district had uh as far as card readers um from our review we felt that most of the access points were 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 well covered. Um, 
the glasses, just typical typical glass uh, as far as there's no safety film on any of them. Again, that is something that uh, some districts they prefer. Some of them, some of them don't. Um, I mean, those were just some of the observations from the study. But anything else in particular that you were some of uh, some of the uh, hardware on the existing schools were were outdated for the classroom doors yes yes there are some notes in there yes thank you joe okay just name and township okay good evening uh, bob miller I uh, live in uh, Conewaga Township. Uh, I see that uh, you have two, uh, and I concur, two driving forces to this uh, objective, uh, one being enrollment and the second being the condition of facilities. I noticed, though, in reviewing uh, previous presentations that uh, the uh, presentation that was given uh, back on June 7th, 19, or, or 2021, um, the organization uh, Crabtree uh, indicated that the uh, uh, facilities, existing facilities, if I'm uh, reading this uh, correctly, were, and I apologize, I referred to the wrong one there, uh, it was, was the August 2nd one, that the existing facilities, uh, this was school district wide, uh, could, should be able to accommodate up to somewhere around 4,200 and, and so students. Uh, so this evening, uh, you've revealed uh, some updates in uh, projection of the population of this enrollment. Um, originally, on back to your June seventh uh, uh, enrollment, it was projected uh, a high point of uh, thirty seven hundred and fifty nine students, which is even uh, a decline from where we were. But now you're you're projecting higher. I would uh, make reference to the fact that on the Pennsylvania State um, Department of Education website, uh, your projections uh, for students going out uh, the next ten years is only up to thirty eight hundred. So obviously there must be some uh, missing data there. You might want to look into getting that uh, updated. So um, I, I just have a hard time uh, coming to grips with the fact that uh, facilities um, overall, maybe not in certain specific areas, like some of the elementary schools and so forth, but overall uh, don't have enough uh, capacity for the uh, projected uh, enrollment. Um, the other thing I'd like to draw attention to is that in your cost uh, analysis, this would be on the, um, I think the uh, uh, cost sheet you put up earlier, which was presented at the previous uh, presentation. Um, interesting item that I noticed there as a reference to energy savings. Um, and if I interpreted that correctly, uh, I know that most of your numbers here in the cost are in the millions, uh, appears that the energy savings were quoted in the thousands, uh, if I'm reading that correctly. Um, the savings, uh, for example, between option one and option two, um, about a 27, I'm sorry, the uh, additional cost uh, to an option two over option one, around $27 million uh, at energy savings at 36,000 only take about 754 years. I'm not sure that that's a big factor. Just want to make reference to that. Um, so the other uh, item to me, I uh, mentioned uh, enrollment, and the other item being condition of the facilities, and I reviewed your um, analysis of the buildings. It does look to me like um, there's a lot of items there over the years of the age of these buildings that maybe have just not been addressed in uh, maintenance and so forth. So it just does appear a lot of maintenance is needed. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, repair that can be done and utilization of these existing buildings. So, um, you know, my conclusion is that uh, option one uh, with scrutiny, I would say, would seem to me to be the most uh, 
preferential one. Uh, you already have existing facilities out there. There's uh, transportation and things that are all already planned around those existing facilities. Uh, seems to me that that is the uh, better approach to go. Uh, and of course, as you make it reference to, there are a lot of costs a lot of costs that you have not factored in that you know the development of sites and so forth that you've not factored in here for relocation of uh, facilities so uh, uh, like i said option one to me uh, and repair and uh, maintaining the facilities and i think uh, this school district is quite fortunate to have the good facilities they do have uh, very good facilities they just need to be maintained much better than they have been I think there's been some neglect. When you look at the overall budget, too, there's only like 5% of the overall budget, uh, your annual budget, that's being allocated to maintenance. And as I review that, the detail, that looks to me just to be basic, you know, maintaining current things. No real renovation of things. Something comes up, you know, in our homes, we need something comes up and it needs to be addressed. Looks to me like that's not been done. So anyway, option one with uh, scrutinization, with a lot of scrutiny to me, it seems to be the choice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. So uh, if I can address a couple of the comments or questions, I'll try to work backwards. Um, the first one was, yes, you're, I did state that the new school option didn't include the site construction costs. Um, Option one did not include site construction cost either. So there would be some costs associated with that as well. And the point was to the, the point of excluding those, as I mentioned, maybe even more so with the new school options, that there's still some due diligence that's needed. But we wanted to have an apples to apples comparison of the bricks to mortar costs. Um. As far as the new school option as to why that was developed, um, discussing with the board and understanding that anytime you do an additions and renovations project, there's that potential, there's going to be disruption to the delivery of education. Um, so sometimes you just have to look at this other options just to say, you know what, we looked at this option for new construction. We felt that if a district decides to move forward with it, so we felt it was worth it. Some districts would say, you know, we don't, we don't know that the, the cost difference between the two is enough to justify it. There's also always the option to do nothing. Uh, we also put together those options just to bring the buildings up to current construction standards. But if you do that, that is not going to address the educational program. It's not going to address the future enrollment growth that is within the district. Um, and then when you were referencing the projected enrollment presentation that we had showed before, yes, we did have some enrollment projections that included the Department of Education's projected enrollment. Um, on at the direction of the administration. Uh, we have a educational planner um, that also does enrollment projections in discussions with him and the administration. We were directed to use the decision insight third party numbers uh, for the planned enrollment. Those numbers were originally given to us in 2021, and it's just been it's just been in uh, the last week or two that they updated the numbers. Um, so we had we did an analysis of uh, update on the enrollment projections um, recently uh, to reflect those new numbers. So that's that's why you're seeing the differences from this presentation from the presentations on the uh, enrollment numbers from 2021. Did that answer your answer your question? Okay. Current facility should accommodate somewhere up around forty two hundred students. Mm -hmm. Was in it was an overall. Uh, I think that was on the uh, August uh, two uh, presentation. 
page 12 of that presentation. Um, this seemed to me to, you know, that that ought to accommodate the uh, enrollment growth. Yeah, and that's a, that's a total number, that 4,200. And as I mentioned, there's, there's capacity at the, uh, at the uh, 712 level. It's just not at, it's right, exactly. Well, uh, there are some, that's more of an educational philosophy discussion of putting younger students with older students. Um, we, there were a couple of options that we did look at early on with changing the grade groupings. And based upon the educational philosophy of the district, that was something that they didn't move away from. They wanted to keep the current grade groupings that they have. And they thought that that's in the best uh, interest of the student. Okay, we have a question here. Someone has to leave. Can you just give us your first name in your township or borough? Uh, Marissa, Mount Pleasant. Um, question was, and I know you guys kind of mentioned during the presentation a little bit, but it wasn't really clear. So I have a daughter who's starting kindergarten in the fall of 2024, I guess. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, like, as far as I know you don't have it completely planned out, but I'm trying to figure out where she's going to be when all this is happening. So what is the goal as far as construction? And also, I'm a little curious if we do do away with CTE, what is the plan for that property? Are you selling it to help fund this or what's just curious? Thank you. Uh, I think at one point we uh, we did identify between NOE and CTE that that would be the priority project. So that one would occur first. There still could be some future discussions with the district if they would want to combine, if option one was selected and they were going to move forward with the additions or renovations to the two elementary schools. What are the benefits of combined bidding them and doing the renovations and additions at the same time? There could potentially be some cost benefits. Um, but if they were done one after the other, CTE would probably be their priority. That would be done first. When that uh, when that design is finished, construction starts, then they'd move into the design for NOE. As, as a ballpark schedule, any of those projects would take about a year to get through the municipal approvals and the building designs. Um, but that is, that's once the board selects that option. So that's when the clock would start. Uh, probably two months or so for the bidding and to get the numbers back and for the board to approve the contracts to those contractors. And then we would probably figure a, a two year construction duration. And we would try to like to, we always like to align the construction is complete in the summertime. So it's ready for the start of the new academic year. So you could factor, you could figure that any one of these projects would probably take about for the renovations, three years total. And then just you guys, if you, you're talking about doing away with CTE possibly with the option two and option three, because you're going to combine into right. one big school. So do you guys have any plan for what you're going to do with CTE? So at this point, it would just be to vacate it. I think that the district would have options on what to do with CTE. Could it be leased? Um, is there a potential buyer? Could that buyer then offset some of the costs? Um, they could mothball it. it. That land could potentially be an asset somewhere down the road, but Nothing has been decided yet. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Question here in the back. Hi, I'm Sam from Hamilton Township. I'm also a teacher at NOE. I teach second grade. This is more of a comment, so it's not really a question. But as a teacher and parent in the district, I'm concerned about option two and three. 
Role models are extremely important in the elementary school. Without grades two and three being with K and one, the younger students won't have the role models that we have in a smaller setting and being intermixed. Also, as a teacher, we strive to build relationships with all students, not just our own students. This helps the younger students be more comfortable with the teachers that they will be having later in their elementary career. If we are in separate buildings or completely separate wings, this will be difficult to do. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Question down front. Cody, I'll get you next. Pete Sox, Berwick Township. Uh, question, but more of a statement. When did you reach out to municipalities in the school district to get actual numbers on development? You don't have to answer that because I'll answer it for you and for those in attendance tonight, you did not. And if you say you engaged the county, that was the wrong uh, level to go to. In this commonwealth, the townships and boroughs control what happens within our borders, not the county. I can tell you based upon what we heard last month from your president, you didn't do your due diligence and consult with the municipalities simply based on the exaggerated numbers and comments that were being thrown out at that meeting. Furthermore, just because a home is built doesn't mean the demographics buying said home is of childbearing age or have children. I can tell you in Berwick Township, where I serve as chairman, we have two developments being built currently. One is Cambrian Hills, which is located across from Hanover Toyota. That development is soon going into phase two. And I can also tell you, I've personally walked through that development and spoken with the residents there. And I'd guess uh, accurate number would be 50 to 60% of those folks are coming here to retire and protect their retirement funds from Maryland and will not be adding children to the school system. Our second development, Burke, is the bridges at the golf course. Low quantity of homes in that uh, phase one, about 56, same scenario. And phase two, if it happens, is slated to be a 55 and older community. Again, that has not gone through approvals or anything, but it's simply discussion now. And again, no children added to the system. Were any of you aware of these two developments? Of course not, because you didn't engage with the municipalities. I would suggest you take that step before making any decisions on which choice you make. Further, I'd like to present the idea tonight of an Eastern Adams Regional Council of Governments of which I'm willing to organize and help run that would include representation from the school board, each municipality in the school district, both Eastern Adams Regional Police and the Pennsylvania State Police who both serve our area and the fire companies that service our area as well. The Adams County Council of Governments has its place, but it is too broad to tackle issues specific to this area of the county. The stakeholders that would be involved in this area are the same ones who came together to prevent the highly dense development in Hamilton Township proposed by Burkentine in the not too distant past along 94. Again, comments of the last meeting made by your president that the local governments are not doing anything to prevent developments I find amusing and ill-informed as I stood there and fought that development. My township is just one example, and I know there are other municipalities here tonight with similar stories to which I now yield the floor to them. But again, I leave the conversation open to a beneficial, localized council of governments encompassing stakeholders in the Conewaga Valley School District so that smart decisions can be made on what we are discussing today and in anything that arises in the future. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Pete. Hi. Hello, I'm Lori Duncan. I'm the business manager for the district. And I would like to say to the certain gentleman, um, thank you very much for your comments. Um, you may want to check with your planning commissioners with all the townships, um, as I have set up a document that I have shared with all of them, and they update on a regular basis with any developments that are happening in the area. Um, they communicate with me on a regular basis, so you may want to check with your planning commissioners. I have all their emails I've shared. It's a Google Doc, um, so they all have that document. And yes, we have checked with the townships and the um, boroughs, as I said, they have all updated the forms. They keep me in plan, uh, aware of the plans. Um, so we have done our due diligence, but thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Duncan. In the back, we'll get to Mr. Mummer. Uh, Cody Mummer, Berwick Township. Um, I he kind of 
touched on my question. Uh, my only concern would be how far is the planning commission planned out? Uh, I know we have the one there across from the shank farm. Uh, that's in the very early stages. Uh, bridges is in the very early stages. They, you know, how, I mean, those numbers can't be really, I guess they wouldn't be foreseen very well because they're in such an early planning stage. So my ask would be, why would we not try to expand larger than we need to get, hold us at 85 to 90% versus let's get to 60% because, uh, and name a farm in town that's going to be sold in the next 15 years, 10 years, five years. So, you know, those numbers could be inflated very drastically in a very short time period, I guess would be my concern. Like, why did we only go so far basically to the end of the project? Well, as I mentioned, the, the enrollment projections are put together by a third party consultant, not by our office. Um, so Decision Insight, they're the ones that are contacting the planning commissions to get that information. You know, my understanding is some, some of the development that has already been approved within the district, um, it's actually been approved for several years. It just hasn't, hasn't begun yet. Um, so I, I can't fully answer your question as to um, how far out that they're looking towards, uh, but just to note that um, they have contacted the municipalities in some manner or the uh, or another, or maybe even through the district, to factor in those new residents into their enrollment projections. I guess my fear would be that we've gone. At, what'd your numbers stop at? Twenty twenty. Um, help me here. I'm, yeah, I'm not twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty seven, twenty eight. So my fear would be that we're going to be in this same boat in 2026 yeah. as some other districts in our neighboring counties. And, you know, they ran yeah. into that, built brand new facilities. And within three to five years, yeah. they were they were way past capacity. So as far as the recommendations that we would make to the planning is that, as I mentioned before, your typical life expectancy of some of these building systems is 20 years. So designed for the next 20 years. And typically enrollment projections are going to go out either five to 10 years. Uh, based upon the planning number, build in an additional 10% into your building capacity that can take you out to that 20-year time frame. The Department of Education also, um, that's how they also work their reimbursement uh, subsidies to the district that it was over a 20 year period of time. Uh, so I always wanted to make sure that you were um, designing those facilities to have that additional capacity, because once you were given that reimbursement, you couldn't go back and apply for more reimbursement for another project until that 20 years was up. Thank you, Cody. Okay, Charlotte. Charlotte Schaefer, Conewaga Township. This is a statement and there might be a question at the end. Um, I also am a supervisor down in Conewaga Township and I will agree that the buildings are aging. Conewaga Township Elementary is older than I am, um, but so is our community. Our community is also aging. So I will give you some statistics directly from the US Census Bureau. This is from the 2020 census data. The population for Conewaga Township in 2010 was 7,085. The population as of 2020, which was the most recent census, was 7,875. That is an increase of a total of 790 people, not children, not children within the school district. According to our PRB, Population Reference Bureau, located in D.C., there is a decline in U.S. population growth due to population aging and declining fertility rates. Population growth is projected to increase at a slower rate 
through to the year 2050, well below the replacement level of what used to be 2.1 births per woman. The U.S. Census Bureau also reported a birth rate drop and an increase in single adults without kids. Dr. James Thorpe, a certified OBGYN, as well as a specialist in fetal maternal fetal medicine, who has practiced OBGYN for over 42 years and sees between 6,000 to 7,000 high-risk pregnancies per year, Dr. Thorpe has an article due to be published in a major peer-reviewed medical journal in March, which contains statistics using the FDA and the CDC's data thresholds. These statistics include a 57-fold increase in miscarriage, a 38-fold increase in fetal death and stillbirth rates. I would ask the district and the board of directors to do their due diligence and research and collect data independently. What was presented in statistics at the last presentation was very inflated. The development in Conewaga Township, this was also covered at the last meeting or the last presentation. Development in Conewaga Township, there is one with less than 90 homes. The other proposed development is from Homewood, which is for seniors. The Eisenhower Drive, it's a little misleading to say that it will bring in development considering the majority of its path, should it even reach the final approval. The majority goes through industrial and a track of land that is in ag preservation. It can never be developed. Going back to the aging of the building and the aging of our community, the aging in our community, CTE has been part of our community. As you stated, it was built in 1958. It has been part of our community down in Conewaga Township for, for longer than I have been alive. To take that away would be taking away part of what makes Conewaga Township our community. As for the aging, they are on fixed incomes. And based on your numbers, the 300, you know, the um, average home, I'm not sure exactly what the average home is, but you take a $300,000 home to a retired person who is living on a fixed income, not all have a pension, many draw just on social security. That would mean an increase of $693 a year. That could be their medicine for one month or two months or three months. That is a lot of money to a senior citizen who is on a fixed income. So I would urge the board and the administrators to really consider the financial burden that it puts on the senior citizens who either, well, they don't have any kids in the district, they may have never had a child in the district, and the expense is being subsidized by the senior citizens or those of us without children. And I do accept the invitation and I will take it back to my board of supervisors from Mr. Sox and Berwick to form a, a community or a regional board. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Schaefer. Okay, we got one down here. Donna Vasek, Hamilton Township. I want to piggyback off what Charlotte said as far as the numbers of um, school children in our district. Um, first off, why hasn't Decision Insight been invited to this forum? We all have a lot of questions regarding their numbers. Um, according to the National Home Education Research Institute, in Pennsylvania alone, there are 25,000 homeschooled students. No one's talking about the homeschooled students. And the numbers are increasing. There are 2 million children across the U.S. and is growing as much as 15 to 20% a year and has shown very little attention within our community as far as the school district. Um, for example, in our school district, ages 5 to 11, 
From 2014 to 2020, which is the last recorded data, the numbers have doubled in Conewago Valley School District. That's here at home. Um, ages 12 to 14, from 2014 to 2020, put us up at 64 students. And they get lower as the age group goes up. So I personally have a daughter who is homeschooling her child and she's only four years old and has no intentions to ever put them into the school district. I think those numbers have to be considered here that it's increasing very much within the community and we necessarily don't need to build this big, beautiful, brand new school. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, we have a couple in the back. Oh, sure, sure. Yes, to Mrs. Duncan. She had mentioned that uh, the townships planning commission sent her statistics numbers on how many, how, about all the new construction. And I think that's wonderful. I think it's great that the township send you the information. I think you and the board of ed should know how many new homes are being developed. Can, can Before I go further, can I ask you, each home, how many children do you assign to each home? Is it 1.1 with for planning purposes? That's all part of the facility study. That's all part of the facility study. The number of children that are assigned to each home. I didn't assign children to the home. Oh, I mean, to, okay, I, I'm not blaming you. I'm just curious. Is it 1.1 per house? That's what I had heard. And like the gentleman you spoke to, ma'am, when you were speaking to him, uh, he said he walked the grounds of a new development. And he found that 50% of those people are retirees from Maryland. I'm a retiree from Maryland for the same purpose, that, not in his community though, for the same reason, for tax purposes. My kids are out of town. They're grown up and they're out on their own. His 50% don't have children either. Yet I think you, the Board of Ed might be looking at these numbers from an office setting. He's looking at it, his feet are on the ground. And I think that's gotta be taken into consideration. There's a lot of retirees, a lot of people that are not gonna have 1.1 children in their house. That's all I wanna say. I'm still Joe from Oxford Township, by the way. Are they telling you the number of residences or the number of children of school age? Okay, that's that's what I'm trying to say. Not every home is going to have any kids, especially in this day and age. I know, I'm not blaming you. I understand. I just hope they take that into consideration. Thank you, Joe. Ooh, question? Okay. Any other questions here in the back? Oh, you got one? Okay, Ryan. Uh, my name is Ryan Fox. I live in Hamilton Township. On the uh, financial millage estimates, what interest rate are you guesstimating would be on, I guess, what the bond financing would be? They were in about four and a half percent. Okay. So over time, that could go up or down. Correct. So we're okay. I understand that. Uh, the population data is really tough. I don't know how you ever try to figure out how many kids are coming out of a household. That's really difficult. Um, so I, I commend you for trying to do that and trying to figure all that out. Um, one of the things that I think about is, you know, we can spend money on things now to do fixes. But the reality is, in 10 years, is it likely that NOE is going to be completely outdated and dysfunctional, even with the renovations that we do? So my fear would be, 
We spend money on those renovations, which I like the idea. You made good points about the culture in a school. Uh, but are we going to end up 10 years down the road at something that's going to cost 50% more? Just like if we'd have done all this 10 years ago, it would probably call 50% less. So just a thought, making sure that if we're going to spend the money on renovations, that we're guaranteeing that in 10 years, we're not in the same boat again, trying to figure out when well, we've got more kids, people became more <clears throat> fruitful, you know, in building their families over that time. So just my thoughts sitting here. And I commend all of you for sitting there taking this. Um, I couldn't do it. So congrats. Thanks, Ryan. Question here in the back. Uh, Arlen Brocker from Mount Pleasant Township. Not really a question, be more of a statement. Um, I'm not an architect. I'm not a builder. But could we design, if we do go with a new building, could it be designed that down the road, if we do have a population increase, it could be added to easily, you know, with a new wing or something along those lines? <clears throat> Yeah, in fact, uh, a lot of the buildings that we design, that's we want to we want to think ahead and think of if it's new construction, um, how can you design it so it's easy for the district in the future, twenty years, that if they do have more enrollment coming in, that they can easily put on classroom additions to the buildings. Uh, design a lot of schools like that. Um, so that's that's a good point. But yes, the building can be designed with future expansion in mind. Thank you. Another question here in the back. Thank you. My name is Patty Chateau Young, and I live in Mount Pleasant. And I just want to make a statement. I want to thank the district for um, what I think is a very nice job, a very thorough job in researching all of the options for this district. I come from York County and I lived in a district that um, was a large district, build a new school building and in five years it was not big enough. And so I hear your comments. Um, I lived those comments. I would also invite community members to go into the two elementary buildings that are currently at 90 to 95% occupancy rate, utilization rate. I just came out of a building that was operating at 105% utilization rate. It's impossible to do that. So I don't envy anyone in this district who has to make this decision because it is an extremely hard decision and a lot of feelings are involved in it. One thing that I value with Conewago Valley School District that I didn't get in York County anywhere is the small intimate feeling that each of the buildings, no matter how big at the high school um, or small at NOE, we had and we currently have. And I hope that whatever decision is made by this board we work very hard as a community to maintain that small town feel, no matter how big or small the building is, because the population of students that I work with don't have that opportunity to have those relationships at the public school level that Conewago Valley School District students are blessed to have. Thank you, Patty. Any other questions? You do have one? Okay, one more in the back. Mike Campbell, Oxford Township. Um, I'm not sure if this question is directed more towards the firm or to the district itself. Uh, if there's any expansion going forward, has there been any consideration on the um, anticipated number of staff to be uh, either grounds crew, teachers, cafeteria workers, whoever? So I'm not sure who that's directed to. It's like Dr. Perry. I got you. I know I am loud enough. I could probably do that. Great question. Um, so the district is part of our comprehensive planning process through last year. So these are internal stakeholders, their parents, their students, their teachers, their administrators, their board members, their district office personnel. 
um, we surveyed them about everything, culture, climate, what do you love about our district? What do you wish was a little bit different? What would make us more fabulous than we already are? And we took a lot of the anecdotal data that came up. And one of the number one um, challenges that came forward through that data was our staffing, that we were understaffed. So we worked diligently to try to develop a staffing plan. So working with administration, having conversations with our curriculum leaders internally, trying to identify what are our actual needs, not our wants, but our actual needs to meet the individual needs of our students and to maintain the health of our employees. Our staff works really, really hard and we don't have enough of them. And so everybody is picking up and doing things um, that are outside of their job description, quite frankly. Um, so we did have a plan when I first came as an assistant superintendent, I can share this story three years ago, where automatically coming in as somebody from the outside coming into the district, I noticed 14 positions that we needed. That number very quickly jumped to 25. Then you start getting into the understandings of what's actually happening um, along the lines of not just the relationships that our teachers are developing with our students, but the complexities of instruction in the 21st century. So, and the needs of our individual students through special education and our aides. So those numbers gradually, personal care aides, um, coming out of COVID as you can imagine, the needs increased. Uh, tremendously. So all of that got dumped into our staffing plan, and then it shifted to a five-year plan that our staffing, um, we feel that we can accomplish within five years, which changed last year to seven years. It will take us officially seven years to meet the needs of the students that we currently have, not even the projected wonderings of where we might end up. Um, so seven years for that. So part of this process that it's my job to ensure that our team is working together to consider both of these plans simultaneously is they impact our budget, they impact our expenditures, and you can't often do one without the other. So what we do know is there will be no positions that will go away. But that's one question that I have received from community members is, if we were to build that new school, does that mean we would get rid of a principal? Absolutely not, because of the needs of our faculty and our staff. You know, so no positions. We just don't have overages of positions. In fact, we had to add a position this year at the first grade level due to an enrollment increase that we thought wouldn't hit our district until two years down the road. It hit us a little bit earlier this year at NOA. Um, so we have to modify and adjust based upon the data that we kind of see out there, also in real time, and what we know through the partnerships that we have you know, with our local governments, um, and also with the communications that we have from our families as part of the data that we're collecting for registration. It kind of helps us to trend and compare where we've been over the course of the past five years, taking COVID into consideration. So plenty of positions will be added um, as part of our normal staffing over the course of seven years. So I hope that that gives the community a, um, a big picture understanding of how we're trying to work through that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Harry? Hi, my name's Harry McCain. I'm a supervisor at Oxford Township. Um, I think I'll echo the previous statement that I think Decision Insight, the, the, the company that did the analysis of what the student population is going to be is probably the most important information we need to have. As Dr. Perry referenced, we were, we're wondering what that population is going to be, correct? So I think what you said. And I don't think we need to be making a decision based on wondering. We need to know these actual numbers. This area is very, very uh, highly impacted by people retiring up from Maryland. We're seeing that. I do it for a living. I have a development in Littlestown that has, you know, it's an active adult community. It's not age restricted. It's added 180 homes to the community and not one child to the school district. But it's not a 55 and over community. Similar to a lot of the communities that, that uh, Pete was talking about, that I think that Joe was talking about, 
a lot of these communities are being attra are attracting people that are retired that aren't having children. When we have to do financial impact studies for our developments, which is required, and I think we've submitted them to the to the school district, um, we're looking at three bedroom homes that we they calculated about 0.5 students, 0.5 children, four bedroom are 1.5. 1. 01 or 1.2, somewhere in that neighborhood, students. But I think, you know, with the amount of dollars that we're spending on this, I think it's an extremely important that we have the exact information that Decision Insight was using, as opposed to, so that we're not backing into a number that we want it to be based on what Decision Insight made, you know, the, the, uh, the suggestions that they made. I think it's important that the architects are here but let's make sure that what we're designing for is exactly what we're going to need and not maybe exactly what, you know, what we think we may need. I, I'd like to really see those, that information as a supervisor in our township, and I'd like to be a little bit more involved with seeing what the exact numbers are that is being that are that was submitted supposedly by our planning commissions, which we as supervisors, Pete and I were just talking. I did not see them. Usually they are in front of us, but I'd like to see what was what was submitted to the school district to make these decisions because they're big, big decisions for everybody here. So I would just like to really see that information. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. In the back. Cody Mumford again. I'm not a real big talker, but um, <laughs> I, I think what these gentlemen are saying uh, is very effective. And I think that I agree that they need to be here for the question and answers. Um, but what I think everybody also needs to understand is, yes, we have 55 age plus communities coming in. But I don't know about you, but when I had my first kid, I wasn't moving into a brand new house. I was moving into someone's second or third home. So my parents are in their 60s, moving out of their first home into a 55 age plus community. So who is replacing that house? So yes, I think the new developments can be a number we need to look at, but at the same time, like just because it's a new development doesn't mean kids. So, I mean, you, you kind of, I commend them. If they did numbers, good on them. But I would like to know how that percentage works in, you know what I'm saying? Because we do have an aging community, but these houses haven't gone anywhere and people are moving into the area because of the cheaper housing, the cheaper taxes and everything for everyone. So I agree. I think we should have them here or have a meeting with them to have those answers. Thank you, Cody. Do we have any other questions? Dave? Not really a question. I'm Dave. I live in New Oxford. Uh, my wife was a teacher in the school district for a number of years. She was down at CTE and she was a teacher down there when they went through the additions about 15 years ago. And I think anybody that was went through that knows that as soon as that was done, everybody realized that, you know what, this needed to be bigger. Okay. So that's one of the fights that you guys are, are battling. And I understand that. Um, I'm 60 years old. I'm not completely retired, but I'm going to be close to retiring. And I know where I live, most of the people that I'm neighbors with are renters. They're not the property owners. Okay. So I think one of the things that we, we need to change, and it's beyond what we're the scope of what we're talking about tonight, is, you know, how do we get to our politicians to make sure that the people that are actually forcing the schools to grow? the young ones that are in the prime of their lives and stuff like that, how they could be charged their, their uh, fair rate since they're the ones bringing the kids in. Okay. So that's my thought. The other thing I wanted to say is we have a school district here who put a, put a lot of time and money into a vote tech type uh, program over here for their, for the high school age. Have we thought or given any ideas of thinking out of the box? 
I mean, we just went through this COVID thing and not that anybody really thought that doing the Zoom classes was an effective tool because you're going to have about two years of kids that really lost out on a lot of education. We don't have any idea how that's going to play out in five, 10 years. But there had to be some things that we could have learned through that, because let's face it, everybody just threw that together as a quick, quick fix. But maybe we could take some of that technology and use it moving forward to maybe not have to, you know, have all the brick and mortar that we that we're paying for out of this program. It's just a thought. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I don't want to miss anyone. Going once. You're welcome to ask a question, Charlotte. Actually, I would. You, oh. uh, <laughs> I just want to touch base on the gentleman in the back over there and the gentleman here. Um, the supervisors from Berwick and Oxford were speaking of not current residents who become a senior selling their smaller house and moving into a bigger house within the school district. They are coming from not just Maryland, it's it's New York, New Jersey, Maryland, California, you pick it outside the county, they're coming within Adams County. It is a very desirable place to retire. And the burden on the school financials uh, senior citizens have become subsidies for the expenses of the kids, which I'm going to touch base on the gentleman back here. I agree. My, but there's no easy fix on, on the school taxes. It is not a um, per person tax like we have what I call the your living and breathing tax, which is that $10 tax. There is not a fair tax. Uh, for each resident within the school district, it is saddled primarily on the retirees, which I again ask to really think about the kind of money that is being spent into the renovation, not go big and go broke at the same time by building. Um, I, I would describe it as maybe a Taj Mahal for the school district. Conewaga Township still needs Conewaga Valley. Um, you know, the elementary school down there. That is part of our community. Um, and I agree that the building is aging, but so is so is our population. And, and again, that is part of who we are down there. And we'd like to see the school stay there. Um, so don't take it away from us. You know, I stayed in the school district with my kids. I moved from one side of the um, school district over to another side specifically to keep my kids here. And now my husband and I are a long way away from retirement, <laughs> um, but we want to stay here. But we also don't want to be taxed out of our house like some seniors will be if the taxes go up and it needs to go to Harrisburg on how, how to do these fundings. But just to keep it low. Sure. We have one more. Pete. Yep. Just real quick, uh, Laurie, I'm in contact with my secretary and the planning commission um, chairman. We might want to fix who we're sending that to because our secretary doesn't remember getting it. So maybe if you send it to the township secretaries to distribute, then the supervisors and the planning commission would both get it. Well, she's going to be contacting you tomorrow. What's that? He's our zoning uh, officer. I wouldn't send it to a zoning officer, but okay. I'd switch it to all township secretaries. To, to be honest with you, if you're sending it to them, I'd switch it to all township secretaries. In our township, we distribute it. The secretary distributes all emails to the board and the necessary people. We can address that. Yeah, we can address that. Mr. Beard. Yeah. 
We can, the question link, sure. We will keep the question link open if you have a question that uh, was not asked tonight. I know we're getting late. Mr. Beard has a question. Yes, uh, uh, Tim Beard, Hamilton Township. And I just finished 18 years as a supervisor in the township. And one of the things which we worked very, very hard to do is to keep it rural, to keep it agriculture, to field, feed the people in the state of Pennsylvania, United States. But we also have had a large number of older people uh, continue to stay here because their families have been here over the years or they've come in. Um, and one of the things which I have had a lot of them speak to me about is they're afraid that they're going to be taxed out of their homes. They're living on social security. Some of them, their social security is only 10 or $1,200 a month. And it hardly covers their food bill, let alone taxes or gasoline or anything else. And their, their major concern is uh, they're gonna be taxed out of their property. Where are they going to live? This area here is very, very uh, friendly towards uh, folks who are over 55, 60, 65 years old. And <clears throat> many of them have worked their entire lifetime to come into a rural area or into a quiet area where they can take and live and <clears throat> not have to take and give up a food or medicine or anything like that in order to stay here. And their comment is, where am I going to go if the taxes keep going up? There's no place to go. And my heart bleeds for them. I don't know what to say. And uh, it's just sad. We just need to think about this uh, as we're proceeding along. And it's not just the school taxes, but property taxes. Everything is going up and the uh, people's incomes are not going up. The, the 60, 70, 80 year old people, they're fixed. And uh, you know the only way they're gonna leave here is in a box. And that's a sad way to have to put your life uh, that you're gonna have to leave in a box. And that's all I have to say, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have one more question in the back. I'm getting my steps in. I need that, that's good. My name is Chris, I'm with the Conewago Township. And one thing I would like to say to the Conewago Township supervisor, how she said she doesn't want to get rid of the CTE building to keeping it down there. If they do choose to shut that building, maybe the township should look into making that into a community center. Hey, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Again, we will keep the live link open uh, to submit a question. Uh, we'll look at those and we can reply shortly. All right. Thank you all. Um, it is 845. We're going to conclude this evening's community forum. Uh, we would encourage you to join us as the board deliberates on uh, March 6th at our next study session. Um, thank you for sharing publicly your feelings on this. As Mr. Muller mentioned, we do have the link available. So as you talk with other members in the community who are not able to join us, please let them know that that link is available. Uh, Dr. Sterner, our brand new assistant superintendent is compiling the questions that were asked this evening. We'll make that public as, as soon as that we're able. So again, we thank you for engaging with us this evening. We hope you have a safe drive home. Yes. I am thinking it's probably going to need to be here based upon the interest. So we'll properly advertise that and make that announcement on our website. Thank you. <laughs>